biggest sucker. Eat my shorts. Oh my god. How's it going, royal ugly geese? You are tuned in to the Monday Night Parlor Sports and Entertainment Sportscast. And now, without further ado, I give to you the one and only Carlo. And welcome to Monday Night Carlo. This is Carl Eggett, the host himself, and you are tuned in and locked on to another show. The show brought to you by at UK Darts, the fun, free, and friendly darts magazine. Give them a follow at UK Darts. Subscribe from your email, and they'll throw you back a fun, free, and friendly darts magazine once a month. Talking about fun, free, and friendly, that's exactly what we are this week. On this week's show, we have an interview with the actor, the TV presenter, an all-round good egg that is Ed to the pole. What a legend this man is. Of course, the host of the legendary Crystal Maze. So let's do it right now. Why not now? Here he is, the legend himself. Straight from the Crystal Dome himself. This is an interview I've done earlier this week with Ed to the pole. Okay, everybody, this is Monday Night Carlo. This is Carl Eggert, and this is our interview section. And this week we have the TV presenter, the actor, the musician, and the host of the cult TV show that we all know and love, The Crystal Maze. It is Ed Tudapol. Ed, welcome to Monday Night Carlo, man. How are you? Hello, Carlo. This is Ed. Hello, <laughs> listeners. <laughs> oh, no, viewers, isn't it? It's, it's TV. <laughs> oh, no, it's radio. Hello, radio. listeners. <laughs> so tell us, uh, to start us off, how did you start your career? So how did it? How did it begin your own career? How did you start it? What was the first thing that you got involved in? Well, you know, I got expelled from school at sixteen, and then I went to some sort of like a sixth form college, right? Um, to do part time drama and a couple of A levels, but I, I was running a bit wild then, and it was in in the days of you know that sort of hippie first bloom. Yeah, yeah. yeah well, early early seventies. Um, so I was running wild, so I got chucked off the A-levels in about two weeks. Kept on with the part-time drama, because it was just like somewhere to go, a holding pen. Right. And then I, I did a part-time job as a dispatch rider, so I had a bit of pocket money. So, it was, you know, I had, a, I had quite a good teenagerdom um, doing all that. But then at the end of the course, she said, well, the woman who did the drama course tried to get me into a proper drama school. So I managed to get into one. Right. Um the Royal, I managed to get to the Royal Academy of Dramatic Art, actually, nice. in the end. Um, just scraped in. And then when that finished, well, the punk thing was fully on. So, you know, I went straight. And it, I wasn't that interested in being an actor, but it's just somewhere for me to, <laughs> probably to do, you know, as opposed to being on the streets. Yeah, yeah. What was the... But then with the punk thing, I immediately understood it and I had to get a piece. So, and I wasn't getting any jobs. I mean, all these people go to acting school. It's a dreadful... It's a dreadful profession acting um everyone thinks it's sort of desirable but it really is it's really horrible right because you're not, you just spend so much time not working you know what i mean so how did you um, what was your sort of first role or first big job that you had ed well i was being turned down for spear carriers in provincial reps right so and then i answered an ad in the melody maker for um wild front man wanted right for new wave group well, I, uh, so I went along to that. Yeah. Of course, I got the job. And then, you know, that's how I sort of started off in in the music. So t- tell us about your band. I know you're involved in one, so tell us about that. Well, I mean, how old are your listeners? I'd say they're 
old geezers. I've got to find my language. <laughs> no, go for it. Tell us, tell us the story, man. I don't mind. Well, you know, so after a few gigs with this band called The Visitors, I was just simply a singer. I wasn't contributing to any of the songs. Right. But I was a very sort of manic frontman. Um, so we got a tiny sort of following beginning to build. But then... Our first review, you see, we got a gig at the Marquee, and in them days, to get anywhere near the Marquee was considered a, a real coup. Yeah. I mean, we were only supporting on 8.30 in the evening, which, well, that's really early, but it went really well, I thought. Um, but the review of it said, great band, the visitors, apart from the bug-eyed cretin on vocals. Really? <laughs> yeah, so, you know, so I thought, oh, well, what do they know? But, but the band... They all took it seriously. Really? So they had a big band meeting. They said, hey, I'm afraid you've got to go. You're a liability. I said, oh, come on, man. You can't chuck me on the basis of one bloody review. That's said, hard. Well, we can and we will. So I was out on the air. Just, you know, it's really depressing, that was. But one of our fans, we only had about five, but one of them, I've never spoken to him since. He rang me up about three or four weeks later and said, Ed, you do notice that uh, Johnny Rotten's left the Sex Pistols and they're auditioning for a new singer. You should go along, man. And I said, I didn't know about that. He says, yeah, it's a tiny little lad in the, in the Melody Maker. Um, and he told me where to go and what time, like the Duchess Theatre or somewhere, some right. West End Theatre. Right. And I said, thanks. I, I can't even remember his name, this bloke, but if he hadn't rung me, man, I wouldn't have gone. <laughs> because I knew I was going to get it. I just knew I was. No one had more sort of volcanic, venomous rage and <laughs> manic energy than I did at the time. Nice, nice. But, um, so anyway, well, I, 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 so I got the job. Oh. So that's how I started. Right, okay. You know. So obviously we need to talk about the, the crystal maze. Every, everybody loves you from it. I'm guessing you still get recognised from it today. So how did that all begin for you? How did that come about? Otherwise, this is going to be a long time, and I can already <laughs> see some of those younger listeners at the back. Oi, wake up! <laughs> um, falling asleep. Well, anyway, to cut a long story short, right. you know, we had a bit of pop success, and I had my own band, and we had a few hits, and then, and then suddenly the acting world, um, just because I was got on top of the pops, right. people started sort of being, asking me to do acting work, and I thought, hang on, what, what's the logic in that? <laughs> um, just when I was taken anyway, up. I needed a rest from the band after about five or six years. Right. So uh, someone, Michael Foster said, right, I want to be your agent. So there I was, I had an agent and a couple of acting jobs. Um, so that was always there, but acting's never more than a part-time job. Yeah, Occasionally yeah. they ring up and say, look, we've got a meeting for you, an audition, go down here, go there. And one time they said, um, the, the, the Crystal Maze TV, they, they, they need a new host. Well, I didn't even know what it was, but, you know, I just go where I'm sent. Yeah. You know, you've got to go to about 10 auditions, maybe you get one. <laughs> so you just, it's part of the job. Um, and I was lucky with my driver, because the minicab driver who drove me up to Harlow, where they're holding the auditions, said, I'll bet you're getting a job, mate. <laughs> I said, oh, yeah, what's that? He says, I'm a lucky driver. <laughs> and I said, oh, good. Yeah, I'm a very lucky driver. <laughs> And sure enough, yes, <laughs> he was the crystal maze. Now that was something else. It definitely was. I mean, as as a big part of my childhood, that was um, definitely a legendary show. So, what what are your sort of biggest memories from the show itself? You see, it's ironic. I've been doing rock and roll for forty years, <laughs> and the crystal maze took ten weeks in all. Five <laughs> weeks the first year, five weeks the second year, and then what about the third series? No, no third series. No, but there's such a big pay rise on the third series. Please. <laughs> no, it's all over, mate. Um, but the trouble was, the learning curve took a year because I did the, the first series. Right. And it's just you work your bollocks off for five weeks doing yeah. show off, racking up the shows, okay? And then you see them transmitted. And as soon as you see the first one, you think, oh, hang on, I know, I could have played that better. <laughs> modify it this way, that way. So a year, a year later, you, you try all these new ideas you've got. And then... And for the third series, it really was going to get good because I, I, I would have been much better at it because there's an art to it. Yeah. Um, 
so I, I think I just contributed mostly enthusiasm rather than technique. But it was getting a bit better towards the end. Um, but I liked doing it because... I was the only, I know everyone hates the contestants because they're so thick, but believe you me, I was the only friend they had, because all the, um, the, the producers, the people in the earphone, right. they were really sarky about the con- um, contestants. Really? So it made me protective of them, you know. Yeah. Because, I, mean, I think the trouble was, they, they, there were too many of the same characters, like, there were too much like each one was like the sixth form nerd. Now, in a perfect <laughs> team, you want one nerdy bloke, one thick bloke, you know, one fat bloke, one thin bloke, you know, one beauty, one ugly. Yeah, and yeah. Like the Bash Street kids for variety. <laughs> but they tend to all pick the same type. But it's not their fault. Um, so, and it's easy for the viewer to call them thick. But the trouble was, you see, just as they're about to enter a game, and I'd say, right, three minutes... In real life, the cam the, they'd cut, yeah. they'd, re- they'd set the camera inside the cell where they were going to play the game. Right. Um, so that gives the contestant 20 minutes to think, bloody hell, man, there's how many million people are going to be watching me? Oh, I hope I don't mess it up. Yeah, and yeah. They get themselves in a riot tears, you see, and, they, and then it cuts. And the viewer, it just looks seamless. Because, I mean, it takes 13 hours to do one show. But really? From the viewer's point of view, it's just one hour. And then you see, right, in you go, and then you see the bloke going in and making a right ass of himself half the time just because he's too sort of nervous. <laughs> so that's my defence for, um, for the contestants. So what do you think? I mean, say I had 30 seconds to go in the Crystal Dome itself. What do you think is the best strategy for me to grab the, the, the gold tokens that are required, Ed? What's the best strategy? Well, it's, there is a lot of strategy involved, actually. There's... The, um, but the thing is, it's not like how it was in the credits um, or blowing in the air. Really? They made that look sort of slightly more picturesque. Right. It's grovelling about on the floor and not just picking up handfuls, but just going for the gold. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's why have you got a theory about what to do. <laughs> Mind you, all of this conversation is going to mean nothing to anyone who hasn't seen the old Crystal Maze. Oh, I'm sure a lot of people have. I'm sure. You, I mean, do you still get um, recognised for it today? I'm sure, like every other day, you must get people ask you about it. Well, I think I get. Um, I don't. Get, I live in London. And I don't get recognised at all in London. But when I go up north, I do get recognised. But it's normally for Ten Pole Tudor, which is the name of my group. Right. Um, but it is occasionally for. Because last week I was playing in Birmingham. Right. And um, I went to the, a little Italian, well, a big Italian restaurant to get some spaghetti early on for the, you know, give me energy for the night. Yes. Yeah. This pasta, of course, being carbohydrates, excellent for rock and roll. <laughs> and um, the Italian proprietor, he recognised us. Right. So he gave me the full treatment. It was really nice. And he sat at my table, bought a few complimentary drinks. Nice. And then he offered to drive me to the gig. Really? Um, because I told the lads to carry on without me. <laughs> so that was really nice. So, there were, you know, advantages like that. And, and the other time, about a month ago, I just played um, um, Portsmouth, a really good gig. Right. And on the train the next morning, reading the Sunday papers, this woman said, are you Ed? I said, yes. <laughs> He said, well, my son, he says you're it, and he loves you on the telly. Because <laughs> apparently they're still showing the Crystal Maze. They are, yeah, on Challenge TV. It gets shown pretty much every day, so... I think it helps if you're a bit autistic, um, or Asperger's. <laughs> got a massive fan base amongst them lot. So, obviously, um, Richard O'Brien is in the original series. Have you ever met Richard before? I have met him, and I have met him more than once, because I was watching his play, The Rocky Horror Show. Right. Um, for six months about a year before the Crystal Maze funnily enough right. um, also funnily enough playing the part that he played <laughs> so some people think I'm following in his footsteps but he's a, he's a charmer he's, he's very funny uh, um, lovely man he's sort of he's turned into a bit of a pixie now <laughs> but, but um, he's never been anything other than nice as pie to me but just charming and, and yeah he's a very nice bloke um as far as I can tell, I can't, I can't say anything bad about him at all. Okay. Not that I'd want to, but but I think you see, he, he attracted different types to the ones that like he, teenage girls more went for him. Right. Whereas okay. my fan base was more like twelve-year-old boys <laughs> and autists. Billy 
familiar element and well I'm not quite sure I haven't done an exact poll but I said, <laughs> you know the band attracts quite a lot of the village idiot element and after all they've got to have somewhere to go so I mean all, everyone's welcome so have, you he- shows. have you heard anything about a remake or a relaunch of the Crystal Maze at all or it ain't going to happen now because the last one was made in 94 right that's too how long how many years ago is that well, that's 10 years ago isn't it that's a long time ago actually hang on that's- Ah, no, someone, that bloke at the back is perked up. You think it's 20 years. That's 20 years ago. Yeah, it's a long, long time. I'm guessing there, that's probably too long to come back on TV then. It is, and all the people involved, I mean, I think, well, they're all getting old and past it, aren't they? But, I mean, do you watch game shows generally? Because it's not not great. I'm not really an expert in game shows. Yeah, I I have done. I just think um, with the Crystal Maze, if they made it today, can you imagine the zones with the technology there is? There'd probably be some really cool games that you could implement. Yeah, but if you notice on the Crystal Maze, there was no computer. That's true. There was no computer screen. (laughs) But I know there was a computer voice. That's very true. But this was sort of irony. Um, It was all about almost medieval games. Yes, yeah, yeah. I mean, those games could have been made last century or the century before yeah. feasibly which is kind of an irony so it's just not that modern I think up to date game now especially with all these Xbox games and all these 14 and 12 year olds being sort of brilliant at fighting the second world war you know <laughs> the graphic realism of them video games yeah um, it, it, wouldn't it seem fairly lame off, do you think it could do. I just think maybe there's a, like an adult retro element that a lot of people would watch just because of what it is, maybe. I don't know. I just... Maybe, maybe. Yeah, well, I've got enough trouble with adult retro element to my music. <laughs> you know, all these 50-odd-year-olds, they want to hear the... Pretend it's the old days, but it's not the old days. It's 2014, and it I want to be part of today. Definitely. Um, when I'm very old, I'll start getting nostalgic, but... People seem... People love looking back, don't they? Yeah, they do. Yeah, yeah. So I think there's a time for looking back, but isn't that at the end of one's life, not when you're blooming 35? <laughs> Very true. So tell us about um, Ed to the Pool today. Tell us about the band and, and what you're up to with musically. I'm doing a one-man electric rock and roll show. Yeah. I've got it down to just a guitar and me and the crowd. But it's taken me 30 years to work out how to do this. Right. Um, it's... It's kind of fun. I'm doing a couple of big gigs with the Buzzcocks. That sounds cool. In Bristol and Newcastle. And when I texted you saying next month I'm playing the Shepherd's Bush Empire and the Forum. Right. With, you know, pretty decent gigs in London. I'm only showing off, and it, but it is true, but it's such a rare and uh, sort of wonderful yes. treat that I am. The first one is um, supporting the dam because it's Captain Sensible's 60th birthday party. Nice. And then the other ones, with the men they couldn't hang at the Shepherd's Bush Empire. Right. Because they they do a version of Swords of a Thousand Men, which was our biggest hit so far. So it's great to be asked to, by these guys. But, you know, with my one-man show, they, they like having me on because they don't have, there's not too many people to pay. Right. And they know that I can warm the whole crowd up for them. So I, I essentially do all the work for them. And they just come on, the crowd's right up there, right with it, all into it. And they just take over from where I left off. And um, I think I should get more money, Carl. What do you think? Yeah, I mean, <laughs> definitely. It sounds pretty cool to me. I mean, you've got to be looking forward to that, right? Oh, yeah, of course. No, I mean, I like it. It's great to play. Because um, I've worked out now that, you see, the band is only the trigger. It's the audience that's important. The audience is the gun. Yes, yes. Um, the band is just almost like the, you know, the what's that name? The, the ringmaster. Um, it's the crowd that makes or or breaks the show. Definitely. The crowd is sort of dull, and the show is going to be dull, and vice versa. <laughs> so and, um, McLaren, Malcolm McLaren, he always used to say that the crowd, the audience, is more important than the band. And I think it's true, really. So it's a sort of communal thing. Um, just loads of humans communing. Well, I mean, I suppose with the because there's not so much religion now, so it's but people like to sing together. It's very good for the soul, maybe. Yeah, yeah. A modern version to congregate and to sing. <laughs> so what? Without going mentioning God, I suppose. But what? when it works, God's sure 
was hell in the house. Everyone happy, everyone smiling, everyone loving everyone. You know, it's, it's, it, that's, well, that's the result of it when it goes well. So it's, it's rather wonderful, I think. So what are the music and the bands that influence you? Well, I always loved the Rolling Stones. Right. They sort of brought me up. Um, it's a good example, actually. Despite all the drugs and degeneracy, ultimately, after 50 years, their lesson has been stick to your guns, don't compromise, work very hard, and, most importantly, always try and improve, however good you are, try and be better. Yeah. That's the clue. So how about um, movies? Are you a movie man yourself? And if so, what are your favourites? Well, recently, it's been hard to pick good films to go and see. I, I, there's a few, uh, the recent batch I haven't been to see, um, that I wanted to, you know. Right, yeah, yeah. There's a few that I've been interested in. I've got like, see The Twelve Years a Slave, but I haven't had a chance. Yeah, it looks cool. Is that good? Uh, well, 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 can, well, you advise me, what's a good film to see at the moment? I haven't seen any um, recent films. The last the last film I saw at the cinema was The Wolf of Wall Street, the Leonardo DiCaprio movie. Now, what's that like? That's very cool, yeah. very. That's a Scorsese film, so that's very different, very artistic. And, yeah, Leo, Leo DiCaprio, you can't go far wrong with, I don't think. Well, that's funny, because my mate, who's older than me, he said, oh, it's just Leo, it's just... Um, really? He just said it's... Um, what's the direct so, <laughs> just a DiCaprio just a DiCaprio movie is that what you said no the director oh, Scorsese, the, Scorsese, Scorsese, Scorsese yeah yeah Scorsese doing Scorsese he was rather scathing about it but all the reviews I read were good I'd quite like to see that one I don't know how interesting this is going to be you, someone who hasn't been to the recent movies I can't just talk about them <laughs> that bloke at the back he wants to join in <laughs> thank you mate we'll come to the studio <laughs> well, we'll open the beer come on get that beer What's the what, what classics? What classics movies do you own, Ed? What what are you into? Okay, if I had to choose one movie, I'd say The Leopard by um, Fellini. Was it Fellini? You know, nineteen sixty three, Burt Lancaster. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, that's, that's a fantastic. Film. We got to see it in the cinema. Right. What's it about? It's based on the book. It's about um, the demise or the non demise of. The aristocracy in Sicily. Right. And the, the essential message of the movie is everything has to change in order for everything to remain the same. So yeah. kind of, but I haven't read the book, but it's based on a, a famous book, um, which I've never actually read. But, um, yeah, I like that movie. I mean, yeah, it's very hard. It's like, what's your favourite record? It's impossible. And whichever one you say... An hour later, you're going to think, oh, no, I should have said that. <laughs> so I don't think, you know, there's anything... I think it's dangerous to sort of just t to tie yourself down to yes. one thing. I mean, there's loads of films that I've loved, you know? I like films, actually. It's the only thing I use the TV for, for <laughs> films. I don't really watch any, anything else on telly. No, I think I'm the same as you. So before we wrap it up, is there any, like, dates you want to lay down for your gigs at all? Or plug once well, again? it depends where you are, um... You can always get my, because I'm gigging most of the time. Right. That's sort of how I earn my money. Okay. Such as it is. <laughs> but all my gig details are, I've got a Facebook page. Okay. I'm a bit of a computer foe, but there's a very nice girl who does it for me. And she puts up the gigs. So if anyone's interested, and like you'd likewise, Carl, if you ever want to come to the gig, just text me and I'll... Well, I'll put you on the guest list, why not? I mean, Thank you very much. no skin off my nose. It sounds very cool to me. I'll definitely be sure to check it out, Ed. It's been uh, a great talk, man. I've really enjoyed talking to you. Yeah, well, I, uh, so how long has your radio station been going for? Um, it's actually not been going that long. It's been going a few months. Um, we're kind of new and off the grind, but um, you're one of the guests that I've always wanted to get on just because of my nostalgia side. So it's really cool to get to chat to you, man. <laughs> yeah, I like <laughs> I hope it all goes well for you. Thanks a lot, man. That is the interview section. I'm Carl Egger, and that is Ed Tudapool. And that was the legendary Ed Tudapool. It was really interesting to chat to Ed. Really come over as a nice, nice guy. Um, very nice guy, actually. Very, very cool indeed. There's a lot more to come from Monday Night Carlo, a lot more guests than the line, but for this episode, it has come to a close. Thank you so much for your listens. 
Thank you so much for your follows and your support. We'll see you next time right here on Monday Night Carlo. Come and like the official Monday Night Carlo Facebook page, facebook.com forward slash MNC. That's facebook.com forward slash E-G-G-E-T-T-C-A-R-L-M-N-C. been listening to monday night carlo all views and opinions expressed by the carlo are all his own and do not represent any other entity 